Hello everybody, welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Inês Hipólito. She is a lecturer at the Berlin School of Mind and Brain at Humboldt Universität zu Berlin, and I hope I pronounced that correctly, where she investigates the reciprocal relationship between the representational structures, basic cognition and the nervous system. She is also an Amsterdam Brain and Cognition Talent Grad Fellow at the University of, the, of Amsterdam, where she studies the emergence of artificial intelligence as augmented cognition. And also, just to mention that she is a co-founder and vice president of the International Society of the Philosophy of the Sciences of the Mind. And she, she also serves as an elected member of the Women in Philosophy Committee and the Committee in Diversity and Inclusivity at the Australasian Association of Philosophy. So, Dr. Hippolyte, welcome to the show. It's a big pleasure to everyone. Thank you so much. The, the pleasure is all mine. Thanks so much for inviting me. Great. So, okay. Uh, I would like to start by asking you about embodied and inactive cognitive science because I mean over the years on the channel I've been talking with a lot of psychologists cognitive sciences and people who basically generally speaking do work on cognition uh, but uh, embodied cognition I've covered it a few times on the show and inactivism uh, not so much so t tell us first what this approach is and what it brings to the table in cognitive science all right. Okay. So it's it's quite a diverse and, and rich um, framework. So it's 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 hard to put it um, in 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 short. But but I'll try at least to, to do some um, uh, introduction that does some justice to it. Um, so basically, e-cognition or embodied and inactive and extended and ecological, etc. Because there are more e's. Um, comes up as a family of um, of frameworks or of theories under framework, that's better, that um, they serve or aim to be um, alternatives to representationalism, so, so to old school representationalism in analytical um, philosophy of mind. Um, so then within this family, as, as always, um, they, uh, they usually uh, agree upon certain, um, certain um, um, claims, but then they're going to diversify and new ones by virtue of specific ways or specific features in which they explain their own alternative to representationalism. Right. So then you have embodied cognitive science, which is is uh, highly um, uh, in, influenced and inspired by, for example, phenomenology or pragmatism. So this is extremely rich, precisely because it's got this very long um, and well established tradition. Um, and then you have, for example, ecological psychology, which is also extremely rich. And then we arrive at inactivism, which um, some people uh, might just call it inactivism, but within even inactivism, there are several variants or um, different accounts. Um, the two major ones are the first one, which is the one that has been um, inspired by Otto Poiesis, by Maturana and Varela, so mostly inspired by um, biology uh, concepts of uh, Otto Poiesis, as well as with uh, or by um, Buddhist philosophy. And then you have radical inactivism, which is more um, fundamentally inspired in um, the philosophy of Ludwig uh, Wittgenstein, and it's called radical in the sense that um, radical inactivism uh, questions whether the other E's, including in, uh, the, the, the other form of inactivism, um, are going to sufficiently deliver the promise of being or serving as um, a solid alternative to representationalism. So this is in very, very short, but I'm happy to, to unpack further. Sure. Uh, and then when we add uh, a dynamic model of cognition to it, and then we have an, an activist dynamic model of cognition, because that's something you also talk about in your work. So. Uh, what is there about, first of all, what are dynamic processes and how do they differ from what we traditionally find as models in psychology, for example? Okay, so models in psychology are fundamentally not 
different from models in any other science. So I usually start by, by that because it is important. Sometimes there is this, this tendency to think that models in psychology or models of the brain are somehow different or more special than the model of the weather. Um, but they're not. Uh, models are um, our best attempts, our best mathematical and computational attempts to um, understand a certain phenomenon that we otherwise would not be able to, um, as well as get some predictive power from it. So be able to predict future states of the system. So this is what a model is in throughout or across any scientific um, field. And then we also do that in psychology and in uh, neuroscience with computational neuroscience um, and in cognitive psychology. Um, so um, I do not, um, or at least I think that I can say that e-cognition and myself included do not overemphasize the role of these models. And that's where precisely this is extremely crucial to understand the difference between e-cognition and representationalism theories. Because what happened was in the 50s with the, with the computer revolution, what happened was that all of a sudden um, psychology gained this important toolkit that allowed them to push back against behavior and say, well, we need to understand what are these hidden processes that we cannot see and behaviorism by explaining behavior cannot explain. So then the computer comes in with uh, this toolkit with inputs, outputs, processes, and all of those sort of, uh, of um, uh, conceptual machinery. And it was useful at the time. Um, the, the, as things unfold for philosophy of mind, there was a tendency to um, repeat the history of employing computational toolkits into the explanation of the mind. Right. So then we had Turing machine in the 50s. So then we have Jerry Fodor employing, well, let's think about the mind as if it were a Turing machine. Right. So then you have the modularity of the mind. But then this, this, this story repeats itself over and over until today. Uh, then you have parallel distributed processing comes up as the new computational um, event um, that was quite important and re revolutionary in computer science. And then you think about, okay, so what if, the, what if the mind is actually parallel distributed processing? And then you have the beginning of connectionist theories of the mind. And then the story repeats itself again now as we live the Bayesian era, right? So now we are thinking about, okay, so what if um, the mind is a Bayesian predictive machine? And then you have all of these uh, story coming uh, even uh, all the way from Helmholtz until today. And then you arrive at these computational models of the brain. So now you have to do some interesting, you have some interesting philosophy to do here, which pertains to uh, whether these models are going to be ontological predictors of what the brain is or what the mind is, or if the models are going to serve as um, these moments of learning. So these tools that you employ and you develop, you engage with as an opportunity for learning about the system that you are targeting, the system of scientific interest, right? So some people might say that um, models are ont ontology prescribers. So uh, that uh, when I use a model to understand or to do some uh, brain data analysis, and I use this model um, with, for example, Bayesian uh, tools, then some people would, as I sometimes say, press the realism button to say that the brain is Bayesian. So it's fundamentally ontologically Bayesian of the Bayesian kind. So the processes, cognitive processes in the brain are of the Bayesian kind. And of course, the 10 people working with other different models, if they also press the realism button, they're gonna say exactly the same, but with their own toolkit being what is the case in the brain. So then um, this is, I'm, I'm mentioning all of this so that I, I sort of like give a little bit of lay of the land of on how we arrive at then more complexity models and how they differ from this story that has been this um, this uh, very tight connection between um, computer science and philosophy of mind. It is almost inconceivable to think, okay, if sort of like thought experiment, if it weren't the case that we had computer science and we did have philosophy of mind as a discipline, as a subject area 
without computer science, what would, would be our theories of the mind? Because what we have as the history of analytic philosophy of mind is, um, so the traditional Western one, is always employing and applying the best computational toolkit of their time. And then we have a theory of mind. So um, complexity comes from a different angle. So complexity, instead of starting off with a premise that the brain or the mind is a computer, which is the premise that has been permeating throughout time's analytic philosophy of mind, complexity starts with um, the observation of the natural world. So it doesn't start with the premise that the mind is a computer, therefore let's see what, what kind of like system of thinking do we arrive at once we start off with that premise. So it starts with the premise that things in the world um, are of a certain kind. And that kind is of a complex system. Why is it a complex system? Well, it has certain different features that make it a complex system. So for example, it is an open system which means that is, it is in this state of autonomous precariousness, which means that the system uh, on the one hand self-organizes to maintain itself, but a condition to self-organize to maintain itself is that it interacts with the world. That's what it means to be an open system that seemingly defies the second law of thermodynamics that stipulates that everything should tend to chaos or entropy and die. So we are magnificent because we actually defy this law and maintain ourselves alive despite the odds set by the second law of thermodynamics. So we are these open systems. So that's what, what I find interesting about complexity science as opposed to the mind machine metaphor permeating my thinking about mind is that you start off with the observation of the natural world and that the natural world is permeated by open systems, is permeated by complex systems. And then you can use a set of tools, which is dynamical systems theory, that allows you to model those complex systems, which is also very interesting. Um, but what is it that makes systems complex? What is this complexity coming from? Uh, well, uh, intuitively, one would say, oh, because they are quite difficult to understand. That's rightly so, but it is more than that, is that in the very core, of the, the definition of complexity is a very fundamental and very important understanding and insight, which is that the, the, the system is as more complex or the complexity goes up, the more difficult it is for us to predict the future states of the system. Or put in other terms, complexity goes up, the more difficult it is for us to model the behavior. Um, so complexity, um, intuitively, one would say that um, it is um, as uh, it, it relates to how hard it is to understand the system, and that's of course uh, intuitively correct. But more than that, at the core of the term complexity, it's a much more important insight that we should not uh, lose sight from, which is that um, complexity means that um, a system is hard to model. So the complexity goes up, rises up uh, in proportion to how hard it is for us to model a system. Why is that? Because it has um, de more degrees of freedom. So this is quite interesting because instead of uh, simply um, making an analogy of the brain with the computer or of cognition slash mind with a computer and assuming that it is, there are these inputs and uh, these inputs and outputs and, and processes happening in the middle that we need to understand we are all starting off with a very humble position where we understand that systems are quite complex and there is a range and diversity of complexity. So for example, a complex system could be, uh, for example, bacteria, right? And bacteria is less complex than, for example, human behavior. So human behavior would be sitting on the very top or, or, or one of the most conceivable uh, complex uh, systems would be human behavior. And this is to arrive at your question about models in psychology. Models in psychology are models of any other kind, except that the complexity is really high. That's, that's still a bit uh, for, for, for now. Okay, so let, let's try to unpack that a little bit. So first of all, I would like to understand a little bit better 
if and how uh, this would have implications for how we think about certain issues in psychology, for example. So we usually tend to talk about uh, uh, people having traits. And by that we mean um, usually fix, uh, fixed and immutable uh, psychological traits, I guess, or immutable entities. So. Uh, with that in mind, with all of what you said in mind, do you think it still makes sense to think about traits? Well, it makes sense to think about traits, but not as innate. Um, mm -hmm. So that's exactly the package that one gets from uh, the modularity of the mind, uh, which at, in its, in, I want to say that in its original um, formulation uh, by Jerry Fodor and of course other others um, that are nativists, um, think that or think of the mind as this computer that is hardwired from birth. Mm -hmm. So then it is supposed to develop according to certain hardwired rules and it is supposed to function according to certain hardwired rules. And of course, there's been like tons of pressure from coming from um, science and, and philosophy upon um, the original formulation of these hardwired mechanism, extremely rigid, informationally encapsulated, um, um, domain specific um, kinds of um, mechanisms, which we can talk about. Um, there's been a tremendous pressure on that, which has forced many people that uh, are, are sort of sitting in the modularity side of it and the nativist side of it to uh, reformulate and revise that kind of like theory into a more developmental and less evolutionary theory within um, psychology. And of course we still have uh, these two streams nativist um, um, nurture nature uh, debate which comes all the way from Plato and Aristotle. So we still have that um, now um, and uh, or the evil divo now today in, in, in psychology. A lot of people endorse um, a mainstream. So a lot, a lot of people endorse like this middle ground between the two. Um, one hardly finds, I think, um, only apart from, from a few people that have been actually under the target recently um, because of chat GPT and langu large language models such as uh, Steven Pinker um, or Chomsky. Um, they are quite a nativist about, about language. Um, but what um, in the understanding coming from complexity science um, as opposed to the more computationalist approach, it is quite uh, true that the computationalist approach tends to be a little bit more nativist, even though it allows for development, but by, 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 by saying that the system is supposed to develop in a certain way, given certain conditions, then that's the direction that the system is supposed to develop. So it allows for some development, but still has some nativist grounds. Um, complexity um, is quite different. Because in complexity uh, applied to psychology, there is no such thing of thinking of um, group level analysis, for example. Um, so it's not one um, recipe that will suit uh, all the individuals, for example, struggling with general mental health conditions like autism, like like autism or or, or anxiety or depression or um, any kind of those. So, in complexity, um, the the there are many features that are quite relevant, but I'm just going to mention this one um, for now, which is that it has an individual approach. It is tailorized to the individual. So complexity when applied to treatment um, and understanding um, and developing or, or um, coming up with, with interventions, uh, mental health interventions or even well-being interventions for the society, um, it looks at uh, individual trajectory. So an individual is an individual trajectory, which is quite different to the group level analysis on average kind of thing that is usually uh, pursued by, by cognitive psychology. Mm -hmm. And what is the role that then culture plays here? What would be, for example, an inactivist account of culture? 
Um, yeah, okay, so I've got, I have one paper uh, that uh, precisely focuses on that. We call it uh, cultural permeation. It's a paper with um, Sean Gallagher and um, Daniel Hato. And um, it is um, very much inspired in, um, in cultural practices by uh, Wittgenstein. Mm -hmm. And um, the idea there is, of course, we are not taking a nativist approach uh, because, of course, we are sitting on the inactivist side with all the respect to um, all, uh, the other um, researchers um, following the more nativist approach. No, we, we there we think that um, the cultural um, embeddedness or the cultural situatedness in which a system develops plays a, ma a major fundamental role um, in development. Um, and we call it cultural permeation because we really want to emphasize that it permeates everything that we do. And by saying that permeates everything that we do, a representationalist theory in philosophy of mind would not um, disagree with my statement. A representationalist uh, could perfectly turn to me and say, well, uh, we also think that um, the engagement with the environment and the cultural uh, surrounding development is extremely important. What a representationalist would say is that the way that cultural and uh, social cultural setting influences uh, development is and must be explained through a mental representation. So a subject is somewhat a spectator, wondering, making inferences, building models, making mental representations to make sense of the social cultural setting around or in which the subject is embedded. So that's what we reject. So all of us would agree that cultural play is a fundamental role. I think so. There might be, of course, some representationalists that would take the more nativist way, but, I, but, but, but it's perfectly possible to be a representationalist that thinks that cultural plays a fundamental role. The way that where we diverge with that is that we do not think that um, cognition comes down to uh, mental representation. So we do not um, reject that um, human beings, because they've been enculturated with symbols like numbers, concepts, they went to school, they started listen to the, listening to the narratives that they, their caregivers uh, would, give, would, would tell them. Um, so because of all that enculturation, then they became skilled through development and that uh, that those symbols they became skilled to use those symbols in a certain way and now they, be, they, they 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 gain the new skill and this new skill is that now they get to articulate their own personal experience to express their own psychological states right this doesn't make their psychological states contentful in any way it just means that now I have the skill to express to you how I feel or how I felt about certain things, right? So that's where we pathways with representationalism, because for representationalism, cognition in everything that we do is a form of mental representation. So in a way, you are, as a, as a, a cognitive system, you are always engaging in an epistemic task, even when you are feeling, even when you are imagining, even when you are experiencing a sunset, you are engaging in an epistemic task of explaining what the world is through the through mental representation. So when we say cultural uh, culture permeates everything that we do, we really mean it. We mean that um, that in the sense that culture is the beginning of cognition where even from uh, when you are born and you start interacting with the world, you do not have these conceptual toolkits um, or this symbolic uh, toolkit, but you are still engaging with the world in a certain way, um, that it feels like something, that has got some kinds of experience, and you start noticing some forms of patterns. And all of this is situated in a social cultural environment because you are not um, uh, a living being uh, uh, growing up, of course, in, a, in an encapsulated manner. So these are like the 
for just as an introduction of how we pathways with representationalism and how we think that cognition permeates throughout all the way down uh, not only um, it permeates the, social, the, the, the representational skills that we engage with when we are enculturated with symbols, but also it permeates our experience. So that means then that uh, whenever we have a psychological experience, uh, it is we interpret it within a particular cultural context. Absolutely, right. which is why, um, so imagine this, this, this scenario, imagine that you go to a visit, I, at least I, I, I adore to go and visit um, countries that have a culture that is quite different to me. I love that, that sort of immersion, I, I'm, I, I love that. And the reason for that, it's because there is so much I don't understand. Mm -hmm. Why is that? It's because I have not been enculturated. I have not grown up in that culture. And all of that that I don't understand, which is so much that I don't understand, is precisely enculturation. It's those meanings that are there as you are getting um, enculturated as you grow up. It is all of those meanings that are there, but they are not explicitly told to you. Mm -hmm. This is what is in radical inactivism, basic cognition, or even in complex systems theory. You can talk about that. Um, there's a bunch of literature. Um, so this is, these are the, the, those meanings, those patterns that you see, and you can only see these patterns and recognize them if you have been enculturated with them. So when you go to a, a, a culture that is completely different, diverse from yours, it's the patterns that you miss. That's why you feel like lost. You, and there's so much that you're going to miss out because you have not been enculturated to see those patterns, to see those meanings. So when, we, when it comes to psychology, it becomes even more interesting because you see studies, for example, showing um, cultural variability in depressive symptoms, for example. In some cultures, um, depressive symptoms come up as more intellectual. And in some other countries, they come up as, or in some other cultures, they come up as more embodied um, um, kind. So imagine that with the, all this cultural diversity, where some things that are accepted are acceptable in, within a certain culture are not acceptable within a certain other culture. Things that are reasonable, within a culture are not reasonable within a different culture. So think about as a clinical psychologist that is doing talk therapy in order to help um, someone struggling with some trauma or something that they're trying to work with or work through. Um, imagine having a psychologist or a clinician that does not partake or share a, 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 um, a close social cultural background that might be problematic right and and so um how the social cognition operate then through a, an inactive perspective and is theory of mind important here i mean important not important but necessary here or not um yeah so you can you can um think about so again so what I said about representationalism and how representationalism explains um, culture and everything that we do as, as coming down to mental representations applies precisely to uh, theory of mind or mind reading theories in social cognition. And um, what it states is that um, as living beings interact with one, one another, um, that interaction takes the form of um, mental representation. So the ascription of mental states. And what that means um, is that um, each of the actors that is constructing a social scene are ascribing um, a possibility that they think that the, the other person, uh, a state that they think that the other person is at. So what this looks like to really go down to the core of it, what this looks like is um, as if um, 
the, these subjects had absolutely no access to the scene and were spectators sitting, looking at the screen, for example, um, and looking at the other person that is interacting with them and wondering about what is going on, making inferences. I think that this is the case. I think that this is the case. So it's always applying these models, applying this mental representation to make sense of what the other person is saying. What we think that theory of mind is missing is that in a, in a social interaction, it is not um, an offline kind of situation. It is, as I've just said, an interaction. So that means it's being an interaction means that it is co-constructed, where parts are actors, not spectators. So each part that is in that um, interaction has a core responsibility to build that interaction. There are so many implications once you pursue the theory of mind. There are so many ethical implications, but I'm going to cite that for now. And I'm just going to go through the cognitive science of it. So with theory of mind, what you get is a narrative or an explanation or an understanding of interaction between human beings as not interacting at all, but as being separated from each other making inferences and ascribing mental objects like as almost like throwing mental objects at each other hoping that it is the case so then i can um now go to how um an activist or e-cognition i would say in general would reject that to say that However, it, it, it can even be the case that we don't understand or cannot understand yet a, a social cognition truly yet. But one thing that seems unreasonable is to think of social actors co-constructing a scene with responsibility being described or characterized as having no responsibility whatsoever as being spectators and just throwing um, mental representations, hoping that that's the case. So that sounds unreasonable. So what e-cognition theorists think is that, of course, in social interaction, there are going to be moments in which you are not really sure what is going on. You are confused. And it's in those moments when you are confused that you are going to, 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 to employ and draw from inference skills that you have learned to try to make sense of that thing that is being confused right now. I'm a little confused. I'm not sure what you meant. Um, I'm not sure what happened um, there. Um, why, why did the person react like that? So these are the moments where you start theorizing. But that does not necessarily mean that in a social interaction where there are co-constructive, uh, there is a co-constructive social narrative to be told there, um, down to always, hmm, I wonder, I theorize, hmm, maybe that's this. There are so many meanings that are there that are not explicitly told. And it is way easier for me to pick out or for a social actor to pick out on those meanings when the subjects interacting with each other share a common uh, social cultural background. So I'll, I'll go back to the example of going to uh, a, a different culture, a culture that is quite different to the one that I've been mostly enculturated with or something like that. Of course, this is a rudimentary example, but I think that it works for, for, this, for this purpose. Um, so if I'm engaging in a social encounter, in a social interaction within a, a, a culture that I'm not really um, enculturated with, I am going to be missing out on many meanings. And those are the meanings that are there, that are being shared, that are being co-constructed, reinforced, so bias are being reinforced, uh, challenging of bias can, be, can also come up within and taking place and generated within this social interaction, as opposed to the very spectator kind of uh, sitting on the couch, wondering what is going on, when what is going on is, I am co-responsible for what is going on. Right. 
So uh, let's get now into uh, artificial intelligence. You also do work on that. Uh, so how does inactivism apply to artificial intelligence then? Well, um, it's quite interesting because within e-cognition, um, the theory that is mostly most lined up to deal with that problem that has been since 98 um, is uh, the extended mind. Um, because it is precisely the theory that um, aims to explain how technological devices, gadgets are incorporated to play a role in cognitive processes. So the extended mind would seem like uh, the most suited to now deal with artificial intelligence. Um, well, I dispute that. Um, and that's part of my work um, at the moment, um, is to precisely uh, do theory development on how um, artificial intelligence just um, is just as much part of our um, enculturation as anything else is. So I dispute the extended mind and I am trying to put forward um, a, a different way and an activist way of understanding the permeation of AI into our lives in every level, uh, but also how AI development and design is our responsibility. So one thing that there's there are there I, I think of course I think there are many difficulties for the extended mind that uh, come to light even more so now as we develop AI systems. Um, the extended mind, even though it is part of the, it is under the umbrella of the ease and has been around for, 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 for a long time and has done a very good job in um, sort of like moving away and disputing the idea that cognition reduces to the brain at work. So it has done that very good uh, leveraging in cognitive science and it's been quite, quite important in that. But it does sit on one of um, the sides of the spectrum that is the e-cognition family. And that side of the spectrum is the one that is neighboring representationalism. Um, the extended mind is a representationalist theory. Uh, this is uh, very clear uh, from Andy. Um, so where it becomes innovative is that it calls in the body to play a fundamental role in cognition. But the role that is played by the body is more representation, less, um, less charged with semantics, less charged with with semantic content in inner model than the brain, but it is uh, operated by, via, and guided through um, action-oriented representations as Andy Clark defends so. And the whole system, brain, body, environment, or brain, body, and uh, a, a gadget from the environment is an information processing system. So in that sense, the extended mind is very much aligned with representationalism. So I dispute that um, because um, there are many reasons to do so. But one of the reasons being the quite obvious one, which is reducing um, mental life to uh, mental representations. And uh, then there is responsibility as well. So the conceiving of these gadgets as if they were things that show up in the environment and then we just sort of like attach them and now they're part of um, the cognitive processes. Mm. That sounds that sounds uh, quite dangerous, but but very useful for for um, uh, tech uh, free markets, because then that allows them to um, sort of like uh, overlook um, regulations. But that's a, a different kind of kind of side. One thing that I agree with the extended mind is that. Um, these gadgets are going to play a fundamental role in the shaping of cognition. I do agree with that. I just don't agree that cognition comes down to mental representation and information processes. But I do agree with that with the extended mind. They do play, but, but from a different angle. 
So completely uh, coming from uh, what I've what I've been saying about how cultural play, plays a role um, in in cognition, it's because the cultural practices that we engage with are going to shape our identity, right? And if you think now about what are the cultural practices that we engage with? Well, we engage with is all of these um, ways of thinking, um, rituals, shared beliefs, values, all of these are cultural practices that, that are completely and totally embodied in the ways that you move around the environment. Now, if you go on and, and become a scientist or a techno scientist um, or someone that is engaging with developing technology, developing AI, then um, that means that you are also engaging in a cultural practice. So the development, the design of these AI gadgets is a cultural practice. It is go, why is it a cultural practice? And, and AI or technology is not just things that show up because of some reason. It's because we as a community, we as a social cultural community, define, uh, again, in a very implicit manner, but define the problems that we ought to solve as a community, the problems that are relevant to this particular community to be solved. So that's already in itself a cultural practice. So you have a very, very simple example that we all have lived in the last three years. So the, um, the mRNA technology mm -hmm. has been around since the 80s. And yet it took a pandemic to kick off, start that technology to a complete different level. Well, where not only we were able to now deal with coronavirus, but also we found some um, other applications for it in, 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 different, in many other different diseases. So technology is highly cultural. So technology is not something that shows up in the air and nobody really knows. No, it's something that is completely and totally motivated and driven by the necessities, the, 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 the needs of a social cultural setting. And in that case, it was a global one. But what I, what I mean is that technology is not just something that is available and we attach to our own, um, cognitive processes, uh, such as Andy Clark. Um, so, yeah, so, so technology is not something that um, shows up and then it's available to, for people to use and then it plays a role into cognitive processes. No, we are very much responsibility, responsible as a community um, to um, or, or for the kinds of technologies that are going to um, that we're going to give rise uh, to uh, through our uh, social cultural practices in techno science. So that's one way in which um, technology AI um, it comes and is completely shaped by social cultural practices. And then you have the other side. And then you flip things around and you ask, so the first question was how, what is the form or the shape of um, the emergence of technology and AI? So that's one, well, it's cultural. That, that's what, that would be, that's my theory. And then you can ask the flip side of the question. What is the influence or the impact of that emergence into a human identity? And by human identity, I mean people's individuality is being shaped by the availability of certain technology, digital worlds, uh, and AI smart environments, but also defining us as a human species. Mm -hmm. So I think that there are these two sides that are quite relevant to address that I don't think that a representationalist theory of it can address whatsoever. And I'm not even going, um, expanding on um, the ethical side of it. Right. But you, at a certain point, you mentioned their techno science principles. And I would like to ask you a very specific question about that, because I know you're also interested in this subject. So uh, I read about, I, in your work, I read about feminist uh, techno science principles. So, 
Could you tell us about that and if we could use AI or human robot interactions more specifically to subvert gender norms? Yes. Um, so I first, I must uh, preface this by saying that mm -hmm. I am not a feminist techno scientist specialist. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, uh, I hope uh, I will be one day, but I am not. Um, but there are some concerns uh, that come, um, rightly so, from this literature that are very relevant um, to the cognitive science of AI. And these concerns are not new, so to speak, because these are concerns that come from, epist from feminist, epistemolo feminist epistemology of science uh, about science. Mm -hmm. So this comes from a standpoint theory, um, which basically uh, in very, very simple terms is the view that if models of the natural world are representative of a main narrative, usually a male dominated narrative, then do we really have a, a encompassing a model of the natural world if they do not include um, a diverse, uh, perspectives, and this, of course, has tremendous ramifications in science, such that such as uh, many studies being uh, made by using mostly male subjects, which then, of course, are not going to translate into other groups' needs. So they're not speaking to nor solving problems in other groups' needs. So that's a problem in science. Um, so. There is also this positivist kind of um, influence in trying to separate separate uh, science from techno science. Uh, sorry, science from technology. Mm -hmm. So it's a very positivist way of thinking things and thinking that science is this holy grail that needs to have these standards for objectivity and and the technicality of it is it's not as relevant. It's important, but it's not as relevant. So some people tend to avoid the term techno science by virtue of endorsing this scientism about science. Um, and what in general feminist theory uh, wants to say and identifies in many different ways um, is that both of them, uh, science and technology, are practices, are social cultural practices. Um, so um, we might or would like to have this ideal way of proceeding in science, such as um, believing or wanting to believe that one can be put in an objective perspective and that we won't allow any of our prior views, biases to interfere with our scientific work. One would like to think that that is the case or one would like to think that that is possible. But that is not possible because um, the practice of science is not encapsulated. The scientist is situated in an epistemic community and whether we want it or not, whether we want to deny it or not, whether we, talk, we thought about it or not, and Popper, Karl Popper was very clear about that, whether we have done our, as scientists, as a scientist in an epistemic community, whether one has done the philosophical critical analysis of the methods and theories that one is engaging with or not, we are engaging with certain philosophical assumptions and with certain uh, and we are using and employing certain biases that come from not only our more broader social cultural environment, are you in the West, are you in the East, uh, but also with the specific epistemic community that one is part of. I give you a very, very practical example. Um, if one is at um, a certain particular country or at a certain particular uh, university even, even within a university, there are mainstream ways of doing things and there are more alternative ways of doing things, right? Mm -hmm. And then you are going to find yourself in one of them, right? And then the question is, are you reinforcing a certain epistemic community's system of views or thinking 
or belief, system of beliefs, or are you challenging? But whether or not you do this meta level work of critically analyzing your position or where you are, where you sit within um, this embeddedness of social cultural embeddedness, that's not what we are talking about. What we are saying is that you are embedded, right? Mm -hmm. So denying that is naive and counterproductive. So a better, a better position is to endorse and understand that you are embedded. So now let's map out my position. Let me critically analyze where I am and what is it that I am doing, as opposed to going with the flow, so to speak. So that's what feminist um, theory brings out, is this raising this awareness that when you are engaging with scientific practices, you are within, you are engaging in a cultural practice, meaning that you are not encapsulated from the rest of the world, doing or thinking like a machine in a very objective way. No, everything is going to be fully permeated by the culture uh, and the epistemic community that you are part of. So you must be aware. Uh, such that you can do the work of um, at least trying not to, trying to be fair, inclusive, not to commit uh, biases. Now, how does this translate? Because this, I was speaking to science because I wanted to sort of like uh, uh, shed some light on how that goes in science. Now, turning this to AI and technology, things that get even more out of control because science usually happens and occurs typically not always within the gates of academia and there are advantages and disadvantages of that but that's for another another time um in technology technology is being developed mostly and a lot of it at least in outside of the gates of academia in companies that have a lot of money uh, to develop uh, technology now imagine a world where um a lot of people are um, in these companies developing, designing the future society or the future of a society um, and without having awareness that they are so fully social culturally influenced that around the world, what happens is then that, and this is the future, if you don't have that awareness, what happens is what is happening now. Around the world, you have infinite lines of code that are coming out as we speak continuously that might very well be, there's a high likelihood that they are fully and totally biased for many reasons. Mm -hmm. Lack of awareness, lack of critical thinking, and the vast majority of a male dominant narrative. And this is happening in both fields. So, so to, you know, full circle, close that thought. Um, that happens in science when you develop scientific, you develop scientific uh, solutions for problems that are very dear to a certain dominant narrative as opposed to channeling resources that are going to also solve problems to the representative society that we have. And in technology, the same applies. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, but uh, I mean, the other part of my question here was, so can we use that uh, with the intent, if people have the, that intent, of course, of uh, subverting or at least rethinking gender norms, for example? We need to educate ourselves. So, and still, it, that is just one step because it is very, um, it is quite clear from psychology studies that uh, in many, many ways, there is a tension or a contradiction between what one believes at, and what one does, mm -hmm. right? So that's cognitive dissonance. Um, I might believe that something is really good for me, but I don't engage in a practice that would get me there. Or I might believe that something is bad for me, but I don't engage in the practice of, you know, uh, quitting a certain habit or practice. It's cognitive dissonance. And the, set, the very same happens in these particular fields. So you might be very well aware that you must be inclusive, 
you must be diverse. Um, there are certain ways of being and doing things that are much more preferable as opposed to others. And you might be under that belief, intellectually speaking, and if somebody asks you, you give the right answers to it, right? Because you took, took a moment to think and then you're gonna give the right answers or the, the most reasonable ones under a certain social cultural setting. And then it may be the case that in your actions, you are not going to embody those beliefs. It is very possible. So that's why one must start with raising awareness and education, right? That must start there. And I can, I can speak a bit about that because I've, I've also developed that a little bit in, 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 in a couple of papers. Um, so for example, so imagine that scenario that I was describing, which is around the world, you have a uh, multimillionaire uh, tech companies developing the, the future of the society tech wise, right? So all of those people had to be educated with um, technical skills to precisely do that. So one thing that is quite important is that AI programs in the universities from bachelor's, master's, PhDs have a quite fundamental and mandatory component of um, philosophy of AI, for example, such that we can think together all of these issues as we together shape the new society, a society that is in and is ever more uh, mixed reality as we go in and out of online, offline all the time, right? And, full, and, and ever more permeated by um, smart environments um, and, uh, and technologies. So it is quite important that we are educating those that are going to be coding the future of the society in a way that they are at least aware of the fundamental problems that come with the responsibility of building a future society. So education, I think, is part of the answer, but being also fully aware of cognitive dissonance. But it is a beginning. And then we need to have something else that sort of like tries to um, uh, balance out some issues that might come up with uh, cognitive dissonance or even market pressures, which is regulation. That idea of free markets in technology needs to stop because um, it is quite interesting. It's, 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 there's still a very much free market where you can develop any kind of technology and make it available. And that actually, interestingly, comes um, from a debate in um, philosophy of technology, which is also a very rich field. And the debate is between the neutrality of technology and social technology. So some people would argue that technology in itself, the gadgets are neutral, right? Mm -hmm what makes it ethical or moral or what charges it with ethical or moral value is how people use it. And then you have on the other side, others like me saying that technology and science are profoundly shaped by culture. There are cultural practices, right? They are born of those social culture practices. It's not just only when you use it or people decide to use it. Now we have a responsibility to begin with. The um, neutrality is that view that guns don't kill pe people, people kill pe people. So that's the principle of free market. Let's make it all available and put the responsibility upon their users. So that's why I said that education on the one hand is one part of it, because we need to educate the future people that are building and have the responsibility of building the society. But on the other hand, we need regulation such that cognitive dissonance and market pressures um, do not pass by. Great. So, um, okay, so perhaps this is a good point to get into a question that a dear patron sent me because we're talking here about AI and how it met, might impact society and our cognition. So uh, I've got a question here from Eduardo Castro Mota and he says,
May you please ask Dr. Inez Hippolito how the she predicts AI will impact our cognition processes in the future and how our personalities may evolve into that reality. Also, considering the complexity of the human brain, may she elaborate more on the topic of AI as augmented cognition and how that synergy between brain and AI may work? Yes, um, that's a brilliant question. I'm very happy um, with, with, with answering it uh, because it allows me to now speak towards the positive side because it seems that I've been uh, a bit negative, but with everything, there's always, um, uh, we need to strike that balance. Um, and part of my research at the University of Amsterdam was precisely to think about how positively and negatively AI and technology impacts and shapes our lives. And of course, there are many negatives negatives to it, which come from what I've been uh, speaking about. Um, but I do believe that if with with education, um, with us educating ourselves um, to upgrading um, into a, a better standpoint, a standpoint that is much more inclusive and and ethical and aware. Uh, if we upgrade ourselves into that position, then we can do tremendous things uh, with technology and AI. Um, the possibilities are extremely vast and specifically to uh, more fragile or uh, less dominant narrative groups in the society that have less um, opportunities or that are struggling more in our society. So once we attain that particular standpoint of how can we develop technology that is going to be useful um, for equity purposes in a society, then we are doing something that is very interesting. So um, part of the things that I am working on, um, what well, you mentioned, one of them, which is um, this paper that we have just finished, which is going to actually a special issue that is um, on uh, women in robotics. Um, there's a lot to say there as well, but that, that paper is going there, which is about gender norms in human robot interaction. And there, of course, we have a few examples of where the problem, where the coded bias lies, uh, how smart assistants are usually feminized. So as being having very feminine features, right? So that is uh, quite um, not all right. Um, so, but there's that tendency. And this, of course, stems from the problems that we've been discussing. So the coded bias, the majority of one group, of one social group coding and envisioning the future, right? So imagine that you have a future world, right? That is, the world as you know it is extremely diverse with so many different cultures, with so many different perspectives and point of views, and it's so rich and vast and amazing. And now imagine that you select one group, doesn't matter, one group to envision the future of them all. That is quite not all right. Um, so women, of course, are not gonna be very happy with the fact that typically, as it has been does till now, typically speaking, smart assistants are um, have feminine features. So that's something there that is the human robot interaction intervention that we need to do some work. And there are some very good people, my co authors are amazing, uh, doing uh, work on that, especially in Scandinavia, on precisely working out the reversing of the damage that has been done in that field on human robot interaction. Especially, especially that case can become especially relevant because it is one of the cases where we have this kind of technology that is quite available to someone living in a developed country with 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 the certain resources, which is having like interacting with a phone that has a smart assistant, and of course these things are becoming ever more upgraded. But this is something that people tend to have some access to. So imagine the impact that. That, that is doing is just reinforcing a certain bias towards gender norms. So this is a clear example or on where uh, coding and developing AI is 
a cultural practice. It's reinforcing a cultural practice. So there's work to be done that to reverse that. So that's one example. And of course, there are many other human robot interactions uh, that we need to be aware of on um, what kind of world we want in the future. Do we want to reinforce something or do we want to break it up? So that's where I think that there's the power of technology and AI is to break up with things that are not good to define us as a human species, where we want to be in the future. How do we want to be seen? How do we want to be defined? Do we want to be defined as an inclusive um, species uh, with, with the certain values or, or not? So, okay, so perhaps this will be my last question then because I'm also uh, getting uh, mindful of your time. So, uh, earlier you mentioned something very, interested when I, uh, very interesting when I asked you about uh, technology and feminist uh, principles. Uh, you commented a little bit on science as an institution, how it's practiced. So, uh, and uh, with diversity in mind, do you think then that the, in the practice of science, the diversity we should have in mind mostly would be uh, cognitive and cultural diversity? Because I, I mean, I've spoken to people like cultural psychologists, for example, and uh, we, they talk about how people um, uh, how people are different in terms of their cognition, in terms of their perception, for example, holistic versus analytic thinking, just to give a quick example. So is that uh, the one or at least one of the kinds of diversity that you think would be important to have in science that is uh, cognitive and cultural diversity? Well, absolutely. Absolutely. Because if you start off with the premise where I start that cognition is perme permeates everything that you are, so defines your individuality, defines your identity, right? Mm -hmm. Then it's going to define it not only at the very basic levels of basic cognition, as I mentioned, which is what sets me aside from representationalism, but also your ways of thinking, right? Which would be the cognitive size aspect I think that you are referring to. So that is extremely relevant. So whether you're going to uh, be more talented, more natural, more inclinated to something, some kinds of uh, ways of thinking, it's quite important to have cognitive diversity. Of course, it is then extremely important to have cultural diversity because of this other aspect that I mentioned before, which is the problems that are going to come up as problems that want that scream out for solutions. Mm -hmm. They are dependent on a culture right so then you want to have a lab that is representative of a society right such that the problems that would come up within different cultures as special and important to solve within different cultures have a voice right so they are not in a void just all of us pretending that there is a dominant narrative that will suit them all. So it is, of course, extremely important to have cognitive and cultural diversity within our labs and developing our science, developing our, our philosophy. And then it's also very important to have diversity in our classrooms. Because one thing that I notice as I interact with my students, and then I talk about this with my, my, my staff colleagues in, in the department, um, is that um, female students tend to be less confident. So they approach you with less confidence, they tend to graduate in, 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 in less uh, numbers um, because they, they, they lack this kind of like confidence that, for example, the, their counterparts, um, uh, men in classroom tend to speak up way more um, raise their hands way more. So then we think we need to think about what are the strategies that we need to implement in our classrooms in the university in order to stimulate um, and overcome those confidence problems. Now imagine that you have uh, staff um, that uh, in a department that is majority uh, uh, male, that is majority men, um, that, that has been part of the problem is that once you ask a child to draw a scientist, it would be likely that the, the child would, would um, draw a, a man or a philosopher, same thing. So representative 
also in classrooms, it's also really important. So uh, representative in, in, in labs, philosophy and classrooms are quite relevant. The other thing that is also really important, so it does not stop there, there because otherwise you would be gatekeeping. Um, it does not stop there. There's another dimension that is important to mention, which is that in doing this research and putting these ideas out there, et cetera, there's another dimension, which is science communication. The scientific world needs to stop gatekeeping. It needs to speak to the society. So what do I mean by that? At the end of the day, scientists and philosophers need to ask if the work is having a societal impact. Because if at the end of the day, you're just writing papers, publishing papers and patting yourself on the back that you did a great job, but nobody, in, but it doesn't change anything in the society, doesn't have societal impact, then it's going to be really slow. So it is important that we do these kinds of things that we are doing here. Podcasts, science communication, that we break down the science or the philosophy and make it avail all of these thinkings and thoughts available to the society everywhere. This is extremely important. And another thing is to have an open science kind of concept, make all the data available to everyone to have access to as opposed to gatekeeping. So it's important that when we write grants and we do the research that we always have in mind this societal impact, how we can this research and these public funds benefit the society as soon as possible. So that's the other side of it, I think. Great. So on that note, uh, Dr. Ippolito, where can people find you and your work on the internet? Oh, thanks for asking. Um, just my website, which is just my name, Inesh And uh, yeah, I, I, it's, it's usually it is updated. And also on Twitter, I'm very active on Twitter. So every, every, any, every time that something happens, I'll just tweet it. Um, and it's just my name, Inesh Ippolito. And uh, there I am on Twitter. Okay, great. So thank you so much for the great conversation, for coming on the show. And hopefully someday uh, I will have you back. Thank you so much. It was such a such a pleasure and thanks so much for inviting me and uh, it was such great fun. Thank you. Hi guys, thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing, please consider supporting me on Patreon or PayPal. You will find links to it in the description box of this interview. And also please share the interview, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights Learning and Development Done Differently. Check their website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters. Perorga Larson, Jerry Mueller, Hans Frederick Sunda, Bernardo Seixas, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Visser, Adam Castle, Matthew Whitting, Bordarno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Enrique Alenius, John Connors. Philip Force Connolly, Robert Windegger, Rui Inácio, Zup, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Simon Columbus, Phil Cavana, Michael Stormir, Samuel Andreev, Francis Ford, Tiago Nunes, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Hal Herzog, Nun Machado, Jonathan Leibrandt, João Linhares, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, João Weira, Tom Hamel, Sardas France, David Sloan Wilson, Yassila Dez Araújo, Romain Roach, Diego Londonio Correa, Yannick Puntara, Dana Rosmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pablo Stasebski, Nelek Bach, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, Saima Afzal, Adrian Yegi, Nick Golden, Paul Tolentino, João Barbosa, Julian Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Douglas Fry, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pans Cortez, Ursula Litzke, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Sunny Smith, John Wisman, Martin Eichland, Dr. Bird, Daniel Friedman, William Buckner, Mal Maria, Paul George Arnaud, Luke Gloacki, Georgius Theophanes, Chris Williamson, Peter Wolosin, David Williams, Ruth Towell, Diogo Costa, Anton Erickson, Charles Moray, Alex Shaw, Amari Martinez, Coralie Chevalier, Pedro Bonilla, Ziegler, Bangalore Atheists, Larry D. Lee Jr., Old Herringbone, Sterry, Michael Bailey, Dan Sperber, Robert Grassi, Tom Roth, DRPMD, Igor N, Jeff McMahon, Jake Zul, Barnabas Radix, Mark Campbell, Richard Bowen, Thomas Dobner, 
Luke Neeson and Chris Story, a special thanks to my producers Isa Webb, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Tom Van Egdam, Bernard Igni, Curtis Dixon, Benedict Mueller, Vega Giddy, Thomas Trumpel, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, John Carlo Montenegro, Robert Lewis and Al Nick Ortiz, and to my executive producers Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.